So good afternoon, everyone. I am Artis Bergstotter, the organizer of the ROCKS lecture ser series. And thank you all for joining us here today. And a very warm welcome to our speaker, the literary scholar and senior researcher at the Icelandic Museum of Natural History, Viðar Hreinsson. But he will speak to us about biodiversity and cultural processes. Uh, and there he will discuss emerging theorizations and concepts and how these help us have important conversations that reach across disciplines taxonomically divided into nature and cult culture. So now, Vivar, I am again delighted to have you with us today. And without further ado, I now hand the virtual microphone over to you. Thank you. Artis and uh, thank you, Rox, for uh, for uh, inviting me uh, for this talk. Uh, I'm going to start with a note on the photos. Uh, it, uh, at least uh, the first half of the uh, in the first half of the slides. Uh, last year, I uh, hiked to the top of uh, Oak, you know, the fam famous glacier that uh, is now has now disappeared because of global warming. It's a dormant volcano. Uh, it's uh, 1142 meters high heap of uh, basalt rocks. But uh, the diversity is uh, is endless. And it's a reminder of the, the slides are a reminder of the consequences of uh, human activities. Uh, yet filled with incredibly uh, diverse life. Uh, first, I'm going to say a few words about uh, how science uh, sometimes uh, looks to me. Science seems to uh, divide matter constantly into ever smaller particles as if a God was to be found there electrons, quarks, muons, neutrons, and the Higgs boson that was uh, sometimes labeled as, uh, as the mystic God particle. Uh, these, uh, these are sometimes presented as keys to the enigmas of the universe. And in the life sciences, we have uh, genetics uh, or the idea of a complete mapping of the human genome. And it was presented in a similar manner as a key to ourselves. Uh, physics uh, often present intriguing equations and the search for the equation for, ha for happiness has now begun. Uh, nevertheless, uh, projecting ever diminish diminishing particles upon the universe as well as uh, organisms appears to me partly as a reductionist mechanistic or quantitative approach, or even an escape from the larger context of uh, life and world. We can count galaxies and we can count the stars in the universe, 38 trillion bacterial cells in our bodies and the 86 billion uh, neurons in our head that uh, each is linked to 10,000 other neurons in trillions of uh, connections. This is of course uh, very important knowledge, but uh, perhaps at the same time, an anthropocentric atomist approach now the world is still stuck in a Cartesian or Newtonian mechanistic mindset and the rationalistic narrow-minded domination of nature and of humans. I think we need to consider the larger context of our knowledge of the natural world as well as the human thoughts and activities. In this paper, I want to discuss some aspects of the interface between natural uh, sciences and the cultural studies by linking environmental humanities to manuscript culture, and at the same time presenting something in the direction of a paradigm shift that I think is in the making, moving from anthropocentric, conceptual, and utilitarian domination towards more responsible dialogues. So first we'll have to take a look at uh, the word or concept of nature. Ultimately, this is a question of human agency within nature. So it's re reasonable to start with this tricky question, what is nature? 
And according to the well-known English cultural scholar, Raymond Williams, the word nature is the most complicated one in the English language. On dictionary.com, there are 17 distinctive meanings of the word. The various meanings seem to be either qualitative and even organic or quantitative and objectifying. That is, nature either refers to a condition where no sharp distinction is made between humans and the nature they belong to, or nature is regarded as an object external to humans. In English medieval sources, there are 10 primary meanings of uh, natura, nature, and 11 of uh, naturalis, natural, but since each main meaning is subdi subdivided into often quite distinct senses, there are, in, there are in reality 25 meanings of nature and 29 of, uh, of uh, natural. The original meaning of the Latin word natura is dynamic and organic, derived from the Latin word natus, that means birth, and was applied to translate the Greek word fusis, that is derived from a verb that means natural growth. The word physica, physics in modern usage, is derived from fusis, so physics and the natural sciences are of a common intertwined origin. Nature is a key word in the history of ideas, as humans have, from the very beginning, wrestled with the world's or origins and order, all the way from ancient myths to modern, modern sciences, in order to grasp the nature of things and the order and meanings in the universe. Greek philosophers grappled with nature in a magnificent poem preserved only in fragments, uh, translated as On Nature, but the Greek title is Perifuseos or Fusica, and Pedocles was the first to define the element, air, earth, water, and fire. Love kept them together, but hatred and strife tore them apart. Later, the humoral theory was fully developed by Hippocrates about the four fluids that corresponded to the elements and were also expressed in human temperament. These ideas reveal a variety of identities and potential harmony between humans and nature that prevailed more or less for 2000 years until atomist theories took over. For a long time, this was a holistic idea of humans in nature based on harmony or coordination. The ideas gradually became more abstract as when Aristoteles uh, claimed that nature was the force within things, that is, that it is born and grows, but plants existed for the animals that existed for the humans. Aristoteles was thus othering nature, and that is a similar idea as we have in the Genesis, uh, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. This might be the origin of the dom domination of nature. In uh, St. Isidore's uh, Etymologia, nature is defined thus, nature, natura is so called because it causes something to be born for it has the power of engendering and creating. Some people say that this is God by whom all things have been created and exist. Nature and creation are still inseparable concepts uh, linked by God in, uh, in uh, Isidore's conception. Then we have uh, John Scotus Eriogena who coined a fourfold division of uh, nature, whether it creates natura creans or is created natura creata. Uh, Nature that creates and is not created, natura creans et non creata, is God. Active nature that is created and creates, that's, that's the world. Nature that is created and does not create, natura non creans et creata. And uh, these are material, temporal, and understandable phenomena. And the fourth uh, part is uh, what does not create nor is created is a void returning to God, the beginning and the end of everything. These ideas were actually condemned, condemned in uh, 1225 for claiming identity between God and the creation, but they 
imply living dynamic nature, intimate proximity between the creator and the creation. These dynamic meanings of nature were qualitative, but with his so-called uh, scientific revolution and enlightenment, more quantitative meanings began to emerge. And René Descartes is credited or discredited for reversing Western thinking. There's a dualist split between body and mind, humans and nature, resulted in a mechanistic conception of, of nature, mechanic views that the Newton <coughs> developed further. Natural law was regarded as mechanic and understandable. To that, we can add Francis Bacon's claim to dominate over nature, and then we have a basic utilitarian idea of domination expanded by the enlightenment and practiced capitalism, practiced by capitalism and the industrial revolution. This was a quantitative meaning of nature that was objectified as being external to the human sphere, an object to dominate. <coughs> Excuse me. Baruch Spinoza accepted the mechanistic view, but did not expect humans to sort out all laws of the complicated machine or to dominate it. He equated God and nature, Deus sive natura is his famous sentence, God or nature. God or nature has already created the world and its law. Natura naturans, the creative nature is a primal cause of the creation unchangeable nature, rejecting human domination of nature since, uh, since humans are part, part of it. Natura naturata, the created nature, is an indefinite, in, infinitely diverse product. Spinoza accepts this infinity, and he has inspired modern environmental thinking a lot. The thought inherent in Spinoza and some uh, in Spinoza's and some of his prede predecessors' ideas is that uh, humans are part of a larger whole, nature or creation, nature or creation, and must submit to that. His idea of God is not is a, is his idea of God as nature uh, is uh, is not personified. Uh, then God is not personified as a grumpy old fellow but nevertheless a force that is greater than humans. That set or should set limits to human agency. However, Spinoza's works were, were uh, unfortunately banned for over a century, but disseminated in a variety, variety of uh, clan, clandestine ways. <clears throat> Alexander von Humboldt was inspired by Goethe, who uh, in turn was uh, greatly inspired by uh, Spinoza. Uh, von Humboldt was a great pop star of science in the uh, 19th century in search for harmony in nature and his holistic vision was about context, how everything connects in nature. A great inspiration for many thinkers and scientists while the worldly powers in the shape of big corporations, politics, and technical abilities broke nature down and exploited it. To make a long story short, the domination of nature increased with the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, hand in hand with capitalism, positivism in science, and fragmenting atomist uh, approaches, while contextualizing holistic views gave in. Resistance to this domination and the deadlock it has led to has prevailed and is now gaining strength. Strongly critical approaches to in, in instrumentalist, atomist, atomist technoscience and one-sided uh, disregard for nature, regarding it instead as an autonomous, autonomous and agential force. Carolyn Merchant and Val Plumwood are, are among the main proponent, proponents of this uh, radically critical stand. <clears throat> but I will, in the following, touch a bit upon thinkers and, and ideas that may support a paradigm shift. Alfred North Whitehead has defined phenomena in nature as events within evolving processes. His processual thinking 
developed in the 1920s has inspired a number of scholars and scientists over the last two decades, pointing forward in supporting diversity and flow against mechanical reductionisms, such as uh, Tim Inkle's ideas of wayfaring and a variety of lines and meshworks. Neither, neither life nor culture are fixed entities fit for the reductionist generalizations that Alfred North Whitehead called the fallacy of universals, the accidental error of mistaking the abstract for the concrete. <clears throat> it is important to establish transdisciplinary dialogues across the boundaries between cultural studies and the natural sciences relating to biodiversity, a key concept in biology and ecology, but a corresponding cultural diversity is also crucial. Possible synergies between natural and cultural ecologies need to be explored in order to understand what it is to be human in a complex life world. Prominent current currents in evolutionary biology advocate for a more dynamic, non-mechanistic understanding that uh, Skuli Skulason has pointed out here in Iceland. It can become, uh, these, uh, these currents can become biological partners for studies in cultural di diversity. The biosemiotic concept Umwelt, coined by the Estonian philosophical biologist uh, Jakob von Uskul, implies that every living being moves in a complicated and diverse environment where everything has a meaning in two worlds of perception and effects that form one closed unit, the environment. Every living being has an umwelt of its own in a context and interplay that resembles instruments and melodies. In its composition, nature is completely free in the choice of animals. It wishes to connect contrapuntally. Meaning in nature thus resembles a great symphony that unifies agents in nature. Von Uxkul's work is pitted against Cartesian dualism and mechanistic rationalism that splits body and mind. Emotions and feelings are indeed premises of logical thinking and the activities of the mind are inseparable from the body. The Portuguese neuroscientist Antonio Damasio criticizes uh, René Descartes for the mechanistic split leaning to Spinoza's idea that mind and body are parallel uh, characteristics of the same substance. Damasio's uh, neurobiology, the complex nerve impulses that uh, govern the activities of living beings, reflects mutatis mutantis, an important aspect that uh, corresponds to biodi biodiversity, the diversity of umwelts. Tomasio claims that a cell manifests a strong intention to maintain itself. That corresponds to Spinoza's idea of uh, conatus, active self-perseverance or resilience where mind and body operate in synergy. This idea of conatus applies to cultural dynamics linked to biosemiotics in order to coin an idea of the expressive aspects of humans in nature and environments. Feminist quantum physicist uh, Karen Barat has opened new insights into the material world by way of the new materialism, a line of thinking within en environmental humanities. She discusses what she calls agential realism and the idea of uh, entangled material agencies that reveal a flow toward constant be becoming. Nothing is final, but rather open possibilities instead of a fixed reality. Barrett rejects a mechanistic and reductionist physics that assumes the very existence of finitude that gets defined as a matter. And she claims that nature is neither a passive surface awaiting the mark of culture nor the end product of cultural performances. And Barrett goes further by claiming that matter is not a fixed essence Rather, matter is substance in its intraactive becoming, not a thing, but a doing, a con congealing of agency. 
In an essential realist account, performativity is understood as intra, inter, iterative intraactivity. Barat responds to Descartes' uh, famous sentence, I think, therefore I am, by claiming that uh, knowing is not a capacity that is the exclusive birthright of the human as a self-contained rational human subject. This means that knowledge and science, sciences and cultural studies using poly polyphony as a metaphor like Uskul, speaking of orchestration of meaning by means of uh, heteroglossia. Oh. I jumped one page too far. So uh, I'll... Uh, okay. So I continue with uh, Karen Barrett. This means that uh, knowledge is in a wider perspective a part of a larger context and ongoing process, just as humans are a part of a larger world. Knowing is about the exchange of differences between different parts of the world that is in constant becoming. <clears throat> Bharat has developed a holistic approach to time and history since neither the past nor the future is ever closed. David Abrams' More Than Human World is another important inspiration for the new materialism. With Foothold in merleau pontys phenomenology of perception, Abrams presents a polyphonic, holistic worldview, the many new ways to perceive the meanings of the earth all around us, trusting, at a quote, our immediate sensory experience rather than quantitative measurement, technological instrumentation, and other exclusively human involvements. He discovered an increased sensibility by plunging into nature with an open mind and realized that there was nothing supernatural about the skills of shamans, for instance, just phenomenal sensibility. What these ideas have in common is a notion that human agency is in a reciprocal processual relationship with the environment and this relational way or meshwork of thinking can be transferred to cultural and literary studies. The processual flow of differences gains new perspectives for humanities as well as natural sciences. Like Barat and Abram, the Russian thinker Mikhail Bakhtin breaks up the fragmenting isolation of objects of inquiry by evoking ideas of dynamic and creative flow by his dialogism and corresponding notion of a great time. Dialogism is rooted under polyglot cultural circumstances, simultaneous existence of at least two cultures or worldviews languages or linguistic consciousnesses within a culture and different language layers within a national language. Tensions and dialogues between languages in various situations constantly create new meanings and old, and old texts and expressions acquire new life in renewed dialogues, new interpretations and contexts. Accordingly, the production of a literary work is never final but rather an event in a process. In that sense, literary production resembles biological and ecological evolution. This dialogical becoming also applies to human relations in nature in a deeply ethical sense. Since dialogue requires answers and responses, it is essentially a living responsibility reflected in the concepts of answerability and responsibility in several languages. This is a point of contact with Uskul's Umwelt, as every living being is in complicated dialogues with its environment. Bakhtin bridges dialogically the space between natural sciences and cultural studies using polyphony as a metaphor like Uskul, speaking of uh, orchestration of meaning by means of heteroglossia, celebrating diversity. In a biosemiotic sphere, the, natu the natural environment is a partner in a dialogue. Ultimately, just like living beings and even ecosystems, 
human cultures are endowed with conatus that can defy the massive reductionist and mechanical powers of corporations and states by embracing the networking natures of life. Perhaps these were the last words Becton wrote, and I, I, and I quote, nothing is absolutely dead. Every meaning will have its homecoming festival, the problem of great time, unquote. This idea of a great time reminds of uh, long durée perspectives and reflects an attempt to regard culture as a process in constant renewal in long-term vibrant contexts. There are two questions to be derived from Bakhtin's ideas. Can the sciences see themselves in this larger defragmenting biological context either individually or by means of a, general, of a general method? And can the Spinoza's God or nature become a kind of a dialogical partner for humans, setting responsible limits for human activities? The insights and ideas I have briefly touched upon attempt to break out of the deadlock of Western frames of thought, highlighting processual approaches to be applied to culturally and historically contingent phenomena and processes such as manuscript culture. Literary activities, manuscript culture in particular, can be regarded as ecological and organic. It is a complex decentralized process of reproduction and recreation rather than an exponential accumulation of works of which some are adopted to literary canons. In this sense, every literary act is an event in entangled processes or meshworks that respond to environments. So now I turn a little bit to the manuscript culture. The greatest Icelandic philologist of the 20th century, Jón Helgason, applied very mechanistic methods, neglecting the dynamic or creative aspects of the manuscript culture. But he was also a poet, and in one of his best known poems, he mentions the hands of the scribe that were directed by living nerves, Sturnad av Levande Tö. And he actually grew up near the mountain, the glacier, the former glacier walk. And, uh, and there's one stanza about that in a, in a famous poem that most, well, most older Icelanders know. Uh, Tim Ingold addresses the difference between the scribes handwriting and print in a large context. It is as though handwritten lines continue to wriggle around, refusing to be quelled by the objectifying duress of visual surveillance. Only with print, it seems, was the world finally nailed down. It was print, not writing, that effectively reified the word. Manuscript culture of all times had deep material aspects. In the Middle Ages, the production and processing of vellum and ink, mostly in the hands of specialized craftsmen. Later on, alongside print, manuscript culture spread more widely among the general public. Paper was cheaper than the vellum, while quills and ink could be homemade. Many Icelandic manuscripts were produced in sort houses of various kinds. The sort is a living organism constantly renewed and this extended metaphor of the rhizome applies well to the production and circulation of post-medieval transmission of post-medieval Icelandic manuscript as uh, David Olafsson has pointed out. And I quote, each act of manuscript transmission has links to an infinite number of others in a web of textual circulation. Some are obvious, others traceable, but most of them are and will remain invisible. Unquote. Manuscript culture was conatus, contributing to the cohesion of society by disseminating knowledge and entertainment in synergy with oral law. The manuscript department of the National Library of Iceland keeps 15,000 items of manuscripts and uh, thousands are preserved in, in local archives. And the manuscript contain a vast amount of extremely varied prose, and I read it pretty fast. Uh, you have it on, on the screen. 
annals, stories of all kinds, letters and diaries, various uh, scientific materials such as lapidaries, leech books, astrology and pyromancy. Sagas of all kinds were copied and even composed and rewritten. Accounts of contemporary events and autobiographical writings began in the 17th century. Eco documents that are letters and diaries and huge amounts of poetry that was the main vehicle for literary expression for centuries. Containing stories, psalms, religious poems, memorial poems, and an abundance of everyday verses about events, sex, verse letters, analytic poems, curses, and sorcery. There was poetry on nature and natural beauty, landscape, places, and geography, water, weather, volcanic eruptions, sea ice, cooking, hunger, animals, birds, fishes, seafaring, and mountain trails, nature beings, elves and trolls, heavenly bodies, seasons, the old lunar months, hours of the day and time reckoning, hardships, food, hunger, analytic verses, farming and fishing, farm chores, hay harvesting, coal making, seal hunting, whales, fighting walruses, prayers and psalms against diseases, geography, paradise, the poor condition of the world, superstition, verse letters, Iceland decline, vegetables, tobacco. Rimur were a prominent branch of the poetry. Long narrative ballads, often consisting of hundreds of verses, highly figurative in strict form. The genre dates as far back as the 14th century, and it was a cultural palace in Iceland. About 1,000 dreams are preserved in a vast number of manuscript, manuscripts by about 480 identified authors. Rimur is a plural form, as most works uh, belong to the, belonging to the genre consist of more than one chapter. So Rima, Rima is a singular, in, in singular is a work in only one chapter. The production, reproduc reproduction and consumption of manuscripts form cultural ecosystems that can be linked to material ecosemiotics. Only a small portion of the huge amount of manuscript material has been published in print. The magnitude of the post Gutenberg manuscript cultures is great and the implications of the transition from manuscript to print culture was far from clear cut. Although print was an aspect of the enlightenment, rationalism, industrialization, urbanization, and the reductionist myth of progress. The strength and perseverance of uh, the Icelandic manuscript culture is personified in the works of uh, Gisli Konrason a farmer and fisherman whose profound output in 72,000 pages is a variegated testimony of organic culture deeply embedded in his material surroundings. One aspect of this literary or manuscript culture is common people's thirst for knowledge and urge to express themselves. Children brought books with them herding sheep on bright summer nights and teenagers made ink and practiced their writing everywhere they could. This reveals interesting relations between material surroundings and agency, a cultural conatus from below. Books, texts, manuscripts were woven into people's life, materiality extended into the literary creation. The poet Olaf Rolodum wrote famous childhood memories about life in a poor household on a small farm in a remote community in Northern Iceland. The miserable conditions are often referred to, but the memoirs also reflect mental organic upbringing with stories and poetry mixed with the word of God. The children's games were creative. Physical activities merged with a blend of oral and literary activities they were creating board games out of fish bones, playing cards, chanting Rimur, and reciting and composing poetry. Olaf knew a number of Rimur by heart, probably thousands of stanzas that would fill hundreds of printed pages. Her, her description reveals cultural interaction and conatus, where the interplay between mind and material surpasses heritage and conditions. The children transformed the material around them into toys, the otolith of the cot, suit of calf blood into ink. This was a gentle transformation into intelligibility, spiced with bookish learning and attempts to write.
Kristin Schufusdottir, an excellent writer who wrote at the kitchen table between chores, describes a cultural grassroots in stories about ancestors and local people, people in her neighborhood. One of them was Guðjón Jónsson, who was not sent to school, no more than other children of common origin. Nevertheless, he was intelligent, skilled, and self-taught scribe. In his youth, he practiced his writing with charcoal on a weathered shoulder bone of a horse. Later, he made a quill and made ink out of suit, and eventually he became an artful scribe, writing for his neighbors, and he taught uh, Christine's father to write, for instance. So horse bones are a metaphor for the cultural conatus. Two self-made intellectuals in the 19th century practiced their writing with burned sticks on weathered jawbones of horses. Olaf Sivertsen, who became a pastor and leader of social and cultural renaissance in, in the Bredafjörður area, and he is also the uh, an ancestor of our, our prime minister. Olaf Sivertsen and Sigvaldi Jonsson, a poet who learned to write quite late by writing on the jawbone in the sheep barn and with a stick in the snow. And he developed beautiful handwriting and became an Itra teacher. And he taught Stefan Stefansson to write and uh, the poet I'll mention in the end. So this was the conatus that maintained the manuscript culture, but the content tends to be valued in terms of a literary canon based on, on a li linear idea of literary development. However, subjects and themes are at the same time carried by traditions, receiving ever new external impulses in a constant flow and dialogues with environments. The stories and poetry belong to diversity, belonged to diversified ecologies, nerve impulses of culture in a non-linear fashion, flowing content in a nourished soil. In print, texts lose the organic qualities and spe specific local flair connected to the conditions and agents of poets and rewriting scribes. Printed texts are mechanically produced in a finalized form for the mass distribution. They die in a certain sense, but acquire a new life in the minds of many more readers instead of being reborn in reproduced manuscripts. Each manuscript had its changing umwelts of, of which only traces can be observed. As a material object, it had diverse connections. When it was not an autograph, it was copied from another manuscript that had its own umwelt, being copied from older ones. Each manuscript was handled, read, and even memorized by an in, indeterminate number of people, read aloud for another in, indeterminate number of people as long as it lasted. The content had different functions in different contexts that changed in the course of time. Each work was an individual expression, but also collectively contingent upon social functions, varieties of entertainment and education, reactions to environment and immediate circumstances such as everyday life, human relations, heroism, the demands of literary traditions and preservation of individual and social knowledge. Krachnings Rima, Rima of Peril, is a distinctive subgenre of Rima. There are preserved at least 22 of them, all rather short, usually one or two chapters. The earliest are from the early 18th century, gradually spreading geographically from the tip of the Sneifelknes Peninsula, an area known for fishing and fishing camps, depending on transport by sea. The geographical proximity of the oldest Rimur in the Breidafjörður area indicates that the tradition originated there. They became common in the area and then, as you can see on the map, uh, expanded to Strandir, uh, the Hunaflowe, and eventually to Isafjörðardjúp in the Westfjörð and to Eyjafjörður in the Northeast. The earliest work of the genre is Hraknis Rima Guðbrandt í Skori, by Thormóður Eiríksson of Gvendareyjar on the Breiðafjörði fjórð, north of Snæfilsnes Peninsula. And he was born uh, 1668, about that, and he died in 1741. Uh, that rima is around uh, 100 stanzas and preserved in 28 manuscripts. 
Þormóður Eiríksson was a legendary poet and healer with magical skills as a kraftaskáld, poet of supernatural powers. The Rima relates of Guðbrandur of Skori Island and his perilous journey across the Breiðafjörð Bay to Barðastrand in 1715. Most of the manuscripts are in 19th century collections, but the oldest of them is from the mid 18th century. And the variations between manuscripts indicate a kind of a scribal development of the Rima and even the entire genre. Heroic content and skillful poetry have secured widespread dissemination and popularity. It's possible that the genre originated with this Rima and the differences between the versions might indicate that the manuscript tradition was a blend of oral and written delivery. The oldest manuscript uh, EP 634 octavo, hin minni, the lesser Thorkatla, was written by a well-known scribe the distinguished farmer Thorkell Jónsson of Hraun by Grindavík. Uh, Hraun is a farm that owns a land where, uh, where the volcano Fardalfjall is. He collected material in a number of manuscripts for the sake of knowledge, literary quality, and remarkable content. It's a neat manuscript containing many rimur and poems, mostly by well-known poets, a few romances, and some interesting pieces of educational lore and entertaining stories. Written in 1743 to 1747, it is produced about 18 years after the composition of the Rima, but unfortunately, the Rima in question was inserted into the manuscript in 1850 by a scribe who actually repaired and bound the manuscript, but he may have copied the poem from, a defect, from defect leaves of the original manuscript. We don't know. That is, in any way, a testimony of the regenerative organic power of the manuscript culture. The content of the story is quite uh, dramatic and even with political undertones. The introductory section is called Mansungur and it's uh, conventional and rather long at advice and discussion of poetry, but the most re remarkable stances of the Mansungur are about biodiversity the amazing number of bird species and the different sounds of voices all arranged by God. There is no time to relate the whole story, but it's about one strong skipper and two weak members of the crew crossing Breiðafjörð in absolutely crazy weather. The poem describes vividly the recognizable landscape and geography, as well as the stormy darkness of the sea and the shore, the waves and the storm looking like drifting snow but it had happy ending. And poetic descriptions of sailing in rough seas reach back to the Middle Ages. And there is, for instance, a magnificent description in Sörtlarimur from around 1400. Very late in his career, Bakhtin said this, that I've already quoted once, nothing is absolutely dead. Every meaning will have its homecoming festival. The problem of great time, unquote. Rimur and other down-to-earth occasional poetry extended the human perception of the natural environment. The Hraknis Rimur genre emerged as an organic growth within a cultural system, a story in a conventional form received by listeners and copyists, but has now ended up as a compost of linguistic, literary, environmental, elemental forces, forgotten interactions between humans and their natural surroundings. The poetic work in the composed where semiotic, the poetic works in the, uh, in the composed were semiotic umwelts, events in larger processes, parts of entanglements that do not deserve the fragmentation of modern analytical methods, but need instead a Bactinian homecoming festival. There was actually a momentary homecoming. The prolific poetic output of the poet Stefan G. Stefansson is largely about transforming natural processes, the more than human world into human poetry, a kind of a combination of organic nature, human labor and poetic language. His well-known poem Ramneslagur, in English, A Contest of Power, seems to be inspired by the Ragnisrimur. 
It is about a journey on the sea where human and natural forces merge in powerful language and imagery in a laughing physical dance. When the fingers of the storm forces loud voices out of the strings and the ropes on the boat. The poem reveals how the traditions now have forgotten in the archives can beget offshoots and new branches at infinitum. And this is just uh, this is uh, uh, the poem and uh, and uh, my translation of it, but you don't have to read it. So I'll jump to the uh, conclusion. The actual and metaphorical dialogues between nature, natural sciences, and dynamic cultural processes provide new insights, perhaps into both. Uh, highlighting the sense of uh, diversity and organic growth that might help to break the deadlock of fragmenting mechanistic and anthropocentric approaches and even facilitate a paradigm shift away from domination of nature towards the responsible human dialogues with nature. Thank you.